It was a period of console war, as Sega and Sony fought for control of the gaming space, Nintendo promised the world with its next generation 64-bit system. As one of the first third-party titles announced for this new machine, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire carried with it certain expectations. It may not have lived up to these expectations, but it remains historically important in the world of console gaming and is well worth exploring today. Which is exactly what we're doing on this episode of DF Retro. For anyone following the Nintendo 64 during the mid-90s, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire is likely one of the first games to come to mind. Developed by LucasArts, Shadows of the Empire introduces many technical features and effects that would become staples of the Nintendo 64 platform while also highlighting its limitations. Less than one year after its release, however, the game also received a conversion for personal computers with 3D accelerator cards. But Shadows of the Empire is bigger than just a game. It was part of a massive transmedia campaign designed to restore interest in Star Wars at a time when it had been absent from theaters for more than a decade, and interest was waning. Today then, we're going to examine the return of Star Wars to the spotlight circa 1996, explore the ambitions and failings of the Nintendo 64 game, while directly comparing it with authentic 90s PC hardware. It's been quite some time since the last proper DF Retro, so let's get started. When Star Wars first appeared in 1977, few could imagine the impact it would have, but it quickly became one of the most popular films of all time. In the years following its release, Star Wars became one of the hottest properties around. Companies such as Kenner managed to perfectly capitalize on this popularity with a huge lineup of Star Wars toys, but it was perhaps video games that benefited even more, at least from my perspective. Electronic games all but grew up alongside Star Wars, and it shows in the wide selection of games available in the arcade, for home consoles, and on personal computers. Not all of them were a success, but Star Wars was a perfect fit for the interactive medium. But as the end of the decade arrived, Star Wars itself had lost its steam. The first three films were well regarded and beloved, but nothing new was on the horizon just yet. At the same time, Lucasfilm's interactive entertainment branch, Lucasfilm Games, was making a name for itself. Christened LucasArts Entertainment Company after a 1990 reorganization, the studio specialized in creating point-and-click adventure games. Over the next few years, LucasArts dazzled PC gamers with beautifully animated adventures. It was truly a wonderful time. Despite the close association with Lucasfilm, however, LucasArts itself did not develop a Star Wars game until 1993's X-Wing, though some members of the team did contribute to the development of the Super Star Wars trilogy for Super NES, which was programmed by Sculptured Software. Both X-Wing and its follow-up TIE Fighter were hugely successful space shooters that allowed pilots to jump into the cockpit of various popular Star Wars spacecraft. Later in 1993, LucasArts unleashed Rebel Assault, an FMV-based rail shooter. It was a key title in the rise of the CD-ROM format, and although dated today, it offers more interactivity than most other FMV titles at the time. Then, in early 1995, LucasArts released the phenomenal Dark Forces, a first-person shooter utilizing an in-house technology that competed nicely with the likes of Doom. With its stellar lineup and talented staff, LucasArts would remain an important part of Lucasfilm throughout the 90s. So, Star Wars was in a relatively dormant state then during the early 90s. Games and media were still being made, of course, but it didn't carry the same mainstream appeal it once did just a decade prior. 1994 then marks the beginning of a lengthy journey to bring Star Wars back to the forefront. George Lucas would begin writing what would become The Phantom Menace, the special edition re-releases of the original trilogy were in development, and Lucasfilm would lay the groundwork for a new transmedia project that would become known as Shadows of the Empire. 
Through the release of a novel, a comic book, and a video game, Shadows of the Empire would become a celebration of Star Wars that would help kick the hype machine back into gear before the eventual arrival of Episode 1 and the Special Editions. Taking place between Episode 5 and 6, Shadows would focus on telling a darker story focused on the criminal underworld within the universe. By utilizing the three different mediums, the same story could be told from different perspectives with unique information for each one. Original characters would meet old favorites, and while there were some inconsistencies, the overall tale was rather intriguing. Additional products were of course developed to support this project, including a series of new action figures of course, an orchestrated soundtrack, and a set of trading cards among others. Shadows arrived with all the hallmarks of a major Star Wars film release, only without the film itself, but it did manage to reinvigorate the franchise. Lucasfilm worked with a range of partners to bring this project to life then, and naturally, LucasArts itself was brought in to develop the game. Star Wars Shadows of the Empire for Nintendo 64 began development back in 1994, with a very small team that would eventually grow from 6 people to 20. It was decided early on that Shadows would become a next generation 3D title, and Nintendo's Ultra 64 was selected as the target platform. This was prior to the completion of the hardware of course, and early on the team utilized various SGI workstations and supercomputers to aid development. Now during development, level designers even relied on the tools created for Dark Forces to help build and preview the levels on an IBM PC. And this was useful as throughout most of development there was no real way to preview the game running on the actual target hardware, as it simply wasn't complete. And I think this challenge is important to consider when judging this game. The style of game they were attempting to create simply didn't exist at this point, and they were designing it for unfinished hardware, all with a very small team. Remember, full 3D games were still very much in their infancy at this point, and even things like character control, camera movement, and the like really hadn't been solved. Any developer working on a 3D game at this time was essentially making their own rules and solving problems as they encountered them. It's for this reason that I feel games from this era often feel so unique and different from one another. It's truly a fascinating time. Yet against all odds, the team did manage to reach the finish line on schedule and delivered Star Wars Shadows of the Empire for Nintendo 64 on December 3rd, 1996, just a few months after the system first launched in North America. Star Wars Shadows of the Empire was on store shelves, and the reception was mixed, but with the dearth of software available for the N64, the game did sell extremely well and received a lot of attention from fans. Yet for all its faults, this is truly an ambitious game, and that's precisely what I find so fascinating. Shadows of the Empire combines multiple gameplay types into a singular whole, with of course a focus on storytelling on top. You'll transition from sequences like this, flying around Hoth in a low altitude fighter, to running around on foot shooting at stormtroopers, followed by a rail sequence section, and even an entire stage set on a moving train, not unlike Uncharted 2's famous sequence which would appear more than a decade later. Sure, none of these segments are polished to perfection and they all have issues, but it's still surprising to see just how many different things you can do in this game. The game begins on a high note with the Battle of Hoth, a battle which would influence many other Star Wars games going forward in fact. It's a great way to kick things off. This is the first fully 3D Star Wars game with free movement developed for any platform at this point. This stage features a nice mix of shooting down droids and ATSTs while taking down the giant AT-AT walkers. While it may look somewhat dated today of course, the advantages of the N64 hardware at the time are at least immediately evident. The battlefield itself is relatively large for the time and populated with a wide range of enemies and friendlies. The N64 is a perfect fit for a scene like this in fact, due to its ability to display perspective correct polygons. Essentially the developers can get away with using fewer triangles to build a large scale scene such as this, whereas on PlayStation you'd need to effectively tessellate the terrain into many more triangles near the camera frustum or risk serious texture warping. This is one of the reasons why N64 games often seem to feature larger environments, even if they were relatively simplistic beneath the surface. 
Another key technical feature used here and in other N64 games is texture filtering. This was previously a feature only available on high-end hardware and workstations. It wasn't even commonplace on the PC at this point, but it was standard on N64. By using interpolation on texels, you could smooth out surfaces, avoiding pixelation at close proximity to the camera. Of course, the N64 has a very limited texture cache, thus textures needed to remain relatively small, especially early on when developers were still figuring out ways to utilize the system well. LucasArts smartly created textures that would look relatively smooth when spread across these large surfaces, even though they were very small textures to begin with. In fact, it's very similar in concept to many early CGI renders, where you would have more of a surface color and pattern rather than a highly detailed texture. I think it works rather well in a game like this. Now, it may seem silly to focus on a feature such as texture filtering today, but if you were around during this time period, you would remember that it really was a huge deal. This was a vision of the future in many ways, as texture filtering is extremely commonplace today. N64 was really the first console to be able to display stable three-dimensional objects with smooth surfaces. But it has some rather strict limitations. The system cannot draw a huge number of polygons, or high-resolution textures, of course, so this influences the level design as a result. The design team opted to build these large-scale maps with lots of massive flat surfaces and small textures stretched across the surface. While simplistic in nature, it does help give the game a large sense of scale, which I think is key to the Star Wars aesthetic. Characters are kept on the simple side as well. The large shoulder pads on Dash certainly help reduce the number of required triangles, however. If we remove the textures, you get a better idea of how this model was crafted for use within the game. Enemy models are of course simplified even more, though larger ships and vehicles are nicely detailed. Earlier in development, the team did experiment with motion capture, but was not able to utilize the resulting data, thus it's not a feature in the shipping product. Thus, animation is somewhat slippery in the final game, but it still manages to look pretty good for the time. Now, you may also be wondering how I managed to capture those previous shots without textures, and that's all thanks to one of the best debug modes I've ever seen in a shipping product. By entering your name as Wampa Stampa, with some extra spaces in there, and then entering a rather complicated series of button presses, you unlock access to a menu that grants you full access to a wide range of options, which in this case, help us better understand the rendering. Basically, by toggling different features, we can better understand why N64 games look the way they do. One of the most interesting features is the ability to enable or disable anti-aliasing. Yes, the N64 does indeed use true hardware anti-aliasing. It's a term that was thrown around often in reference to Dreamcast, Xbox, and the like, and even earlier PC cards, but it was almost never utilized in any form. N64's hardware was quite the pioneer in this area then, with two types of anti-aliasing available, the fastest of which eats about 10-20% to of your render budget. The debug mode allows us to examine the game with AA enabled or disabled. Note how much smoother and cleaner the edges appear with this feature enabled. It was used in nearly every shipping N64 game, and it's very effective here. Now, unfortunately, due to a secondary blur pass on top of this, the dithering and limited video output options of the time, it often appeared very blurry on consumer TV sets from this period, but with an RGB setup and the de-blur option enabled, it looks pretty good. In addition to anti-aliasing then, Shadow also showcases one of the N64's dither modes. Now, this was common. The N64 supports multiple dithering options, and the idea is to eliminate visible banding while smoothing out colors across the image. This is needed due to a low 5-bit precision used after a certain blending stage. Now, the side effect of this technique used here is an almost film grain-like fuzz visible across the image, which actually kind of works in favor of the game's presentation. If you disable dithering from the menu here, you'll see that it cleans this right up, but banding instead becomes a serious problem. Now, N64 supports three types of dithering, buyer, magic square, and noise dithering. Shadows of the Empire uses the random noise dithering option. It's hard to say why this was selected, but I'd imagine that the film grain look of this specific dithering mode no doubt contributed to their decision. 
Another neat feature of the debug mode is the option to mess with fog density, distance, and color. You can push out the fog much further than the default setting while modifying the color used. It demonstrates that fog was not a necessity here, though it definitely does slightly improve performance while reducing visible pop-in. Some other cool options include freeform FOV and aspect ratio adjustment. The game by default displays in 4x3 mode only, but it is possible to play around with the aspect ratio values, achieving widescreen images as a result. Furthermore, the FOV can be increased beyond the default as well. That's not even touching on the various other tweaks and cheats available in this mode. I also appreciate the frame rate readout option, which displays the current level of performance and current rendering resolution, which is 320x240 like most other N64 games. Speaking of the debug display, this also gives us insight into the performance cost of various visual features. I wasn't able to use our own frame rate analysis tool on this game due to N64 video noise, but this readout included in the debug display demonstrates how various techniques can impact the frame rate. Note that in this case, the Hertz readout refers to frame rate, not output refresh rate. Now on one side, we have everything enabled, textures, dithering, anti-aliasing, the works. This is how the game normally runs. On the other side then, everything available in the menu is disabled. With all features enabled then, we see a roughly 10 to 20% performance hit on average, though it can vary depending on where the system is bottlenecked. This also reveals that game speed is actually tied to the frame rate as the right side pulls ahead of the left due to its higher average frame rate. Keep this in mind when we get to the PC version. The point is, we now have a better idea of how certain visual features such as anti-aliasing impact performance and also why the Nintendo 64 appears somewhat blurry compared to other consoles at the time. Another challenge facing the developers then when designing for N64 is audio. Shadows of the Empire ships on a 12 megabyte cartridge, which makes audio rather challenging. According to the game's postmortem, still available over on Gamasutra, the team initially experimented with MIDI music but were not happy with the results. Thus, it was decided to use pre-recorded audio instead. Due to cartridge limitations, of course, audio was reduced to 11 kHz in mono. The idea is that, at the time, most people just relied on TV sound rather than higher quality speakers, thus it sounded good enough in practice. Even with this reduction in quality, however, there's still just 15 minutes worth of music included with this version of the game. Naturally, this limitation also means that actual speech wasn't possible, certainly not this early in the N64's life. This ends up working out surprisingly well though, as the story sequences are a high point of the presentation. Basically, the team utilizes these comic book style panels with text. The artwork itself is gorgeous and effectively tells the story. It's good stuff. So with what we've examined thus far, what are our takeaways? Well, I feel Shadows of the Empire is mostly a success given its proximity to launch and its development during the earliest period of 3D game development. We also have to consider that throughout much of development, the developers had no real access to finished hardware. Gameplay-wise, it's somewhat clunky to play, but the mix of gameplay types and ambitious stage design does still leave a strong impression, especially the first and last stages. The developers really tried to find a way to tell the story not just through the comic book style panels, but through the actual gameplay. I feel that the game successfully delivers the large scale that you expect from Star Wars while presenting a wide range of those scenarios within. For a game made by just 20 people during this time period, it's an amazing accomplishment. But less than one year after its emergence on N64, Shadows would receive a conversion. Released in September 1997, the PC version of Shadows of the Empire appeared at a unique time in PC history. The industry was slowly shifting towards 3D graphics cards, but it was still very early. Shadows of the Empire is one of the first games released for the PC that requires a 3D accelerator card to function at all. There was no support for software rendering. This makes a lot of sense when considering the original presentation on Nintendo 64, which relies on features such as texture filtering and alpha blending, something only really available with a good 3D accelerator. 
The downside is that this means you need a very high-end PC. But let's just start with the basics first. What does this version offer over Nintendo 64? Firstly, there's the cutscenes, which are now presented as pre-rendered movies rather than comic book panels as we saw on N64. The new cinematics look surprisingly decent for 1997 with some nice CG animation and modeling, and they even feature full voice acting. The scenes do a nice job of setting up the story in a new way, but in terms of visual quality, I have to say I prefer the original comic book designs. Those designs rely more on a pixel art aesthetic that I think still holds up very well today. It's not like you could actually make out Dash Rendar's face properly within the in-game graphics due to the low polygon count, so it doesn't really matter if they line up perfectly with what you see in-game. Still, for the time, this makes a lot of sense and was generally seen as a good choice. Secondly, there's the music. With the game shipping on CD-ROM, Shadows of the Empire now features a full CD audio Redbook soundtrack streamed directly from the disc. This means those orchestrated tracks performed for the Shadows of the Empire project could be utilized within the game itself, and of course, it sounds fantastic. Lastly then, this version offers support for higher rendering resolutions and frame rates, though this comes with a huge caveat as we'll see shortly. So thus far, we've seen the game running on a 3DFX Voodoo 2 card, and yeah, the improvements are immediately obvious. Resolution is boosted from 320x240 to 640x480 or even 800x600 on a single Voodoo 2. The overall rendering quality appears rather different, however, as the Voodoo does not utilize any form of anti-aliasing, while the dithering itself is very different in nature. Edges are sharper, but less clean. It could be argued that the higher resolution reveals the simplistic nature of the visuals, but honestly, it's still easier on the eyes overall. Aside from the obvious increase in resolution, however, the rest of the visuals appear to have been lifted directly from N64. Textures, models, and the like all appear on par. It may seem silly to say this, but Nintendo 64 was still considered rather advanced at this point, and unless you had a voodoo card in your PC, visuals of this quality were not a common sight on the platform. So yeah, it's still a great looking title for 1997. Unfortunately, this conversion comes with a lot of caveats that aren't entirely the fault of LucasArts. As I mentioned earlier, 1997 was a very tumultuous time in the world of PC graphics cards. Unlike today, where it's really just Nvidia, AMD, and perhaps even Intel competing, 1997 was a very competitive time. You had chips from the likes of 3D Labs, ATI, Rendition, 3DFX, Nvidia, Matrox, S3, NEC, and more, all competing in this space. The problem was, most of them had serious limitations. Nothing demonstrates this better than Shadows of the Empire. While the game utilizes DirectX 5 rather than 3DFX Glide, I determined that really only the Voodoo cards can truly render the game properly. Think about that. Unless you owned this very specific graphics card, and there were only really three or four options at the time, the game wasn't fully playable. So only a small subset of PC gamers could realistically enjoy Shadows of the Empire on the PC in 1997. You know you're in for a bad time when you scope out the game's README file. Version 1.0 that ships on the disc supports just three chipsets, and aside from 3DFX, the other options have huge limitations spelled out right below in the README file. The 1.1 patch then adds official support for additional cards, but again, each of these cards come with their own limitations. But just what kind of caveats are we talking about here? Well, thanks to a friend of the show, I have access to a range of older GPUs that I have slotted into my Pentium 3 Windows 98 PC, so I'm able to share with you today the authentic 90s experience. That said, I don't have every card available. I simply used what I had, including supported cards such as Voodoo Graphics, NVIDIA Reva 128, and 3D Labs Permedia 2, but I also tested a pair of unsupported cards such as the S3 Verge DX and Matrox Millennium 2. So let's start with the Voodoo. I typically stick with a Voodoo 2 as opposed to the original Voodoo graphics in this build, and in the case of Shadows, this means that the game runs at 60 frames per second. While this sounds like a good thing on the surface, the fact is, elements of the game speed are tied to frame rate, and by running at 60 rather than 30, everything winds up moving just a touch too quickly, 
Look at the way this droid bounces up and down here in the N64 original. And then you compare it to PC. You see how much faster it is. I don't think that's correct. It's especially bad in certain sequences such as the speeder bike which feels nearly unplayable on the Voodoo 2. It's important to keep in mind though that according to the readme file, Voodoo 2 is officially supported. But this is the optimal way to experience the game. Voodoo Graphics is the only type of graphics card that displays Shadows of the Empire properly from this era. Every single other card from this time period seems to have issues, so let's check them out. So in version 1.0, one of the three supported chipsets is the 3D Labs Permedia 2, a card somewhat aimed at the professional market that also supports games. Alas, the results are not great. Disappointing considering its 1997 release date. When starting up the game, I received this error message noting that certain features are not supported in hardware. Thankfully, you can click OK and continue and play the game. What that means in this case, however, is that Shadows runs without fog effects, while certain alpha blending operations are handled incorrectly. Despite this, I still think it looks fairly decent overall and reasonably close to the Voodoo card. It's really the lack of fog that kills it, as that reveals more visual glitching in the distance. The Permedia 2 is a rather interesting card though. It was released during the same season as Quake 2, and it does support Quake 2 in hardware accelerated mode. But this card is interesting as it doesn't support the blending modes necessary for colored lighting in that game, so when you play Quake 2 on a Permedia 2, all lighting appears white. It's just another example of how variable different graphics cards were during this period. Even if your card worked, there was no guarantee that it would work correctly. Unfortunately, I don't have access to a rendition Verite V1000 for testing, but based on benchmarks from this era, it was the slowest of the three cards at the time and has its own visual restrictions, so you can assume that it was likely worse than the Permedia 2. Now if we jump over to version 1.1, we can test the Nvidia Riva 128 another officially supported card. This card was released in late 1997 after the release of the game, and unfortunately it has its own set of problems. While fog is supported, there is a serious issue with texture filtering. The underlying pixel structure is now more obvious and textures lack the smoothness that they should feature. It just means that surfaces in general are rendered incorrectly throughout the game. Look carefully at this scene, the snowy texture. The way the texture is blended on the Voodoo side differs greatly from what we see on the NVIDIA Riva 128 side. The resulting textures appear more blotchy. The point is, this has a significant impact on texture quality throughout the game. In addition, in many scenes, visible seams are often present. And on top of that, the 16-bit color dithering appears rather stifled in comparison to the Voodoo cards. Performance, however, is relatively fast on this Pentium 3, though the README warns you that with a slow CPU, the frame rate will be very low. On this rig, however, the first stage does hit 60 FPS, but the others run mostly at 30, which is the correct speed for the game, so it's not a bad way to play, but it definitely doesn't hold up well against the Voodoo cards. It's worth keeping in mind that the Riva 128 is a contemporary of the Voodoo 2, not the Voodoo 1. They released around a similar time frame. Voodoo 2 released just a few months later. But what about unsupported cards? Well, Shadows still runs on these cards, but there are even more severe problems. Take the Matrox Millennium 2, for instance. This card first appeared in summer 1997, just before Shadows launched on the PC. Unfortunately, it also lacks most of the features required to run the game properly. That means no fog, no texture filtering, and no alpha blending, among other things. The game does run, but textures appear as pixelated blocks, while effects such as explosions are displayed as black blobs. Technically, it is playable, but the performance isn't great either. Compared to every other card we've tested thus far, the results here simply aren't good enough, when you see it running on the Matrox Millennium 2, it's obvious why this card is listed in the unsupported category. But what retro graphics card test would be complete without examining the original 3D decelerator? That's right, this is the S3 Verge DX. The DX version was released in 1996, like the original Voodoo graphics I should note, but it's much, much slower. 
Surprisingly, the actual rendering quality is not half bad. It looks visually better than the Millennium 2 and the Reva 128 most of the time, which is something I did not expect. Of course, it is missing those typical effects as well, as you can see when you first start up the game. So yes, that means things like fog are not present. As you can see though, the visual quality means little with a frame rate this low. The game struggles to cross the 10 frames per second barrier most of the time and is so slow that your craft in this initial stage fails to behave correctly. Rather than flying straight, it always sort of dips towards the ground. On top of this, alpha blending operations are so obscenely slow that when an explosion occurs near the camera, performance drops to nearly one frame per second at times. It is completely unplayable. And that's why I feel it's so important to see it in action. It's a reminder of what PC gaming was like in 1997. It was a minefield. If you didn't own a 3DFX card, you were most likely in for a bad time. Now, I built my first PC in 97, but it was still a relatively uncommon thing to do. Most people bought PCs straight from the store, and it was much more likely that you'd wind up with something like a pre-installed S3 Verge over something like a Voodoo card. So in that sense, Shadows of the Empire was not the most accessible of conversions. But if you had the hardware, it could look and run like a dream compared to the N64 original. Gazing back into the past is always an interesting exercise. With games like Star Wars Shadows of the Empire, it's easy to find faults when viewed through a modern lens, but as I hope you've come to appreciate, it was indeed an impressive production for its day. As a game, Shadows of the Empire stands as an early example of linear, cinematic action gaming that would become popular in the years that followed. The type of game that keeps you on your toes with a wide range of scenarios and experiences throughout. As you make your way to the game's finale, Shadows keeps you on your toes, regularly introducing new challenges along the way. It's this variety that I find so appealing. That you'll go from piloting a snowspeeder, to solving puzzles aboard an imperial cruiser, to taking on a massive underwater boss, you never know what's coming next. There's even hints of classic FPS design in here that still holds up today. Most of the issues are a result of the time period when it was made. This game is a pioneer like so many other from this era, and the problems it faced had not yet been solved. So while it has its issues, I find those issues fascinating to revisit. As a technology demo for N64 then, it also demonstrates much of what made the system so potent in the early days. N64 arrived just as 3D acceleration became feasible in the home, and Shadows does a great job of showcasing those advantages. The opening battle on Hoth alone was a huge revelation. Lastly, as a PC conversion, it demonstrates nicely the state of the art circa 1997. It's not the most advanced game around, of course, but it offers a glimpse into what PC gamers of that era had to deal with. 3D accelerators were still very new at the time, and most of them simply weren't up to playing games optimally. While DirectX was used in this game, few cards support it, all the necessary features, thus your experience would vary greatly depending on which card you selected. It highlights exactly why the 3DFX Voodoo graphics card became so popular in the first place. It was the first consumer 3D graphics card that worked really well with a wide range of games. It supported all the necessary features and delivers fast performance. These days it's easy to forget what it was like during the mid-90s, but for those of us that were there, this is a great reminder. Overall though, I hope you enjoyed revisiting Shadows of the Empire with me and better understand why it was a meaningful release at the time. Is it a great game? Not necessarily, but it is an important one. Now, there are still other Star Wars games I'd like to cover going forward, such as Jedi Knight, Dark Forces 2, but we'll have to leave it here for now. So thanks for sticking around to the end. If you want to see more DF Retro next year, be sure to subscribe and let us know. And of course, find me over on Twitter for more retro and CRT-related discussion. And until next time, stay retro.